now I guess we we can start because the, the recording already started so this is not a, a problem i already got the first question whether this is the plan for the lecture today no of course not this is the plan for uh, 15 lectures which i will be uh, giving during this uh, semester so today there will be just an introduction and then during uh, the remaining weeks uh, we will talk about basic parameters of operation flow like Eddington ratio whatever a lot of things then some qualitative examples of accretion flow then we will discuss spherical accretion because it might seem the simplest case actually this is one of the most difficult cases but we will start with that. Then we will talk a bit about uh, GR effects because those effects are essential, but I will not require any, any knowledge of GR from you because, you know, GR, it's not absolutely essential if you want to have a qualitative insight. For example, Professor Paczynski, who contributed significantly to the theory of accretion disk, he never bothered to, to learn GR. And he was doing quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so then we will talk in uh, more depth about uh, classical accretion, these equations governing uh, them. Then a radiation transfer will be needed to determine the, the spectrum of an accretion disk. Then Comptonization, because this is a key effect if we want to explain uh, X-ray spectra. Then time evolution, because actually the models of accretion disks which we have are frequently unstable, so we cannot just study stationary models. Then we'll talk more about mathematical description of variability like power spectra and what is dumped random walk, which is frequently used, etc., etc. Then MHD. I'm not an expert in MHD and somebody asked whether it's the pure, pure knowledge of MHD is required. No, it's not required. I will tell you why MHD is needed. There are a lot of experts on, in the world on MHD and still we don't understand the processes related to MHD in accretion disks. So you see that the situation is, is more complex than just knowledge of MHD. And then uh, we will return again to some specific classes of objects. We we'll talk about gamma rays, main sequence stars, white dwarf, neutron stars, black holes, and then HEN specifically. So that's that's the plan. Then during the lecture, you can you can ask questions. Because, you know, I, I, I don't know actually your, your level very well. And those questions will, will help me to, to notice whether what I propose is too difficult or too easy and too boring. So I can kind of adjust to, to this uh, situation. Okay, so let's start. And then one, one more comment. I apologize for my English, which is not perfect. It's certainly Polish English. On the other hand, uh, I'm less depressed since yesterday because my paper, which was actually written by my postdoc, who is native speaker in English, went to language correction and it returned with a lot of A's and V's <laughs> and a lot of other things changed. So, you know, probably nobody knows English. <laughs> this is the explanation. Okay. So, recommended books. If you want to know more details, then you can look into those books. Accretion power in astrophysics. This is really very, very good book for uh, uh, equations of accretion disks and a lot of other things, including derivation of those equations. Then for radiation, radiative processes in, in astrophysics is a fantastic basic book. 
The third one, black hole astrophysics, the engine paradigm. Uh, I bought that a year or two years ago. This is a really very detailed book, almost about everything. But, you know, if you want to, to, to find something in depth, still before going to, to uh, specific uh, papers, it's a fantastic place to, 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 to search. On the other hand, I don't believe that you will be able to read it. It has 1,000 pages and it's really, really detailed. And then there is one a bit older book, but also quite, quite useful for, for the accretion disk stability in particular. This is this black hole accretion disk. For original papers, I, I think it's worth certainly looking into Shakura and Sunyaev. We will talk a lot about this uh, paper, but there is a lot of things in this paper which we will not quite touch in depth. So this is really recommended. And if you, if you want GR versions of, of equations, then novikov torn is an excellent <laughs> reference. So if you read all those books, you can stop coming to my lectures. Because my lecture will be much, much simpler. Because my, my aim is to give you rather the intuition of what is important and what you need. And then you can search it in the, in the literature. Otherwise, I will not be able to cover all those topics which I listed. And, well, this is digression one. There will be a digression from time to time because I think it's important to have some distance to, to things or some historical remarks or whatever. So first part, first digression, two papers were published in 73. One was Shakura and Sunyaev and that was sent to publication in June 72. And full GR lectures were done already in summer 72 by Novikov and Thor. So you see, if you want to publish something, you should be uh, really fast. Otherwise, perhaps Novikov Thorn would be published before Shakura and Sunyaev, right? And that would be a catastrophe for the Shakura and Sunyaev uh, paper. And why it happened? Why? Uh, Novikov and Thorn were ready to with their lectures in summer 72. Well, Igor Novikov is Russian, Shakura and Sunyaev, they are also Russians. So they, they developed this uh, theory actually before. So Novikov was aware of, of, of the fact that uh, very convenient description of accretion disks uh, were found and they just generalized that to GR. There is nothing new otherwise in that second paper. Uh, then if you want to publish something important, it is better to be correct from the beginning to publish it in appropriate journal. And if you failed to do the second point properly, you should put your paper into archive, even with some time delay, because this will let people have access to that paper. So I list three papers here, Shakur and Sunyaev, 73, the number of citations, 9,000. Linden Bell published his paper four years before, he has 1,000 citations. He almost solved the problem of an accretion disk description, but almost, not quite. Shakura and Sunyaev invented alpha viscosity, and we will be talking a lot about the alpha viscosity. He came with some kind of description of viscosity, but not so elegant. And this was the shortcoming of the Linden Bell uh, paper. But he was really close to, to that, still, Shakura and Sunyaev we. And then the last paper, Shakura 72. Actually, the whole theory, the uh, alpha viscosity was presented in the paper by just Nikolai Shakura, 72. 
the problem is that first he made a, a, an error by 50%. We will talk about it, why he did in equations he proposed, but he introduced alpha viscosity. But he published that in Russia. So some, some time ago, I, I look, looked into this paper. So I'm, I'm sure that he had this kind of mistake, but he had otherwise alpha viscosity. But if you want to see this paper, you probably have to go downstairs and look for this original Russian version. I don't think this paper is available anywhere in the internet. And this is why, why people do not cite that because, you know, it's quite difficult to cite something which you didn't see, right? On the other hand, the, the topic was actually suggested to Nikolai uh, Shakura by Zeldovich. So that was the, the origin of the, of the story. But then Sunyayev realized that the result is great and he collaborated with, with Shakura and they published as Shakura Sunyayev in English in Astronomy and Astrophysics. And this is still the basic theory of accretion disk. Everything which goes beyond is not really a theory, it's a kind of model. Okay, then direct digression two. Because the topic of, of accretion is very complicated and it requires, in a sense, prior knowledge of this MHD or GR or everything. Uh, there are two ways to, to, to approach the, the, the topic. Either to introduce a lot of preliminary material and then at the end to tell you how it applies to actual sources. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of boring because then in, in, in advance you don't know which part is really, which part of physics is useful. So instead, <coughs> we'll be go going more or less along this kind of feature, oh, sorry. Returning to the same things again and again, but in, in every time with, is with some greater depth or insight. So this kind of repeating things is, is, is actually my, my plan. It's not that I, I'm not well organized or something like that, although the point about organization is sometimes also true. Okay, so we will start with the definition of accretion, right? Because the lecture is about accretion and even the definition of accretion is not quite obvious. The first, so first of all, at least in Polish, in, in the 60s or 70s, uh, uh, accretion did not appear in uh, any an encyclopedia or whatever. Uh, it appeared only in an, an encyclopedia published in 95 and then this is the, the, my translation of, of this Polish definition. Uh, I will read it. So it's falling of the dispersed matter on the surface of a star or a black hole. During accretion, the mechanical energy of falling matter turns into heat, which is accompanied by the emission of electromagnetic radiation. In the extreme case of accretion to a black hole, the radiated energy can be 0.4 mc squared, where m is the amount of falling mass, see the speed of light in vacuum. In most cases, and especially in binary systems, accreting material has a significant angular momentum that prevents direct falling on a star surface. The intermediate stage is the formation of a disk around the star known as accretion disk. On the other hand, it's not always that this kind of um, falling into gravitational field is required in the definition of accretion. So, so in some other vocabularies, uh, accretion means growth or fusion. And then in that case, uh, uh, processes in the solar system, like uh, growth of planets, whatever, is also a kind of accretion. So I, I looked into uh, ADS just 
by curiosity. And the first paper, which has accretion in abstract, is actually this one, Nuovo Cimento, 1856. That's not a mistake. It's really 150 years ago. And the title is Sul modo da crescimento dei cristalli e sulle cose, well, whatever, whatever. So, <laughs> It's a, a crescimento is of course a creation, easy to translate from Italian. But you can also see that, uh, well, years ago you could publish scientific paper in any language, including Italian, uh, Russian, German, French, whatever. Now, Nuovo Cimento, the same journal, still exists. It publishes review articles, but of course in English. Now everything is in English for the moment. But if I look which of those papers with accretion in the, in the abstract is the most cited, still Shakura Sunyaev wins with 9,000. And the next one comes uh, Balbus and Holey, 3,000 citations. A powerful local shear instability in weakly magnetized disks. Part one linear analysis, which sounds kind of boring, but we will talk about this. this paper more because it is really the, the, the basis of the viscosity which we use. So uh, the definition of accretion is not uh, well said. And there are uh, some good examples of, of accretion processes in the solar system. Uh, good question is whether rain is accretion. Well, there is a paper on rain in, in, in quasars and then it looks like an accretion. But in, in the case of uh, airs, Rain is falling, but then we have an evaporation. So it's a kind of circulation. Is it accretion or not? Because it's the same material goes up and down. All well, this I don't know. You can the, have also inflow outflow, no? In, a, in some yes, sense. Yes, actually, it, it, it looks kind of similar. There are more spectacular uh, events like Tunguska or Chelyabinsk event in 2013 that was really spectacular. It was an, a meteorite impact, which was uh, really seen. This, this last one was really well recorded. Uh, some 60 million years ago, probably such an impact a bit larger caused the, the dinosaurs to to die. Uh, there are also impacts of, on, on Jupiter. This was spectacular impact in 1994, this shoemaker Levy uh, comet. And nowadays we observe many comets which are sun grazing, so they, they, they pass very close to the sun surface and some of them actually fall into the sun. So this is also a kind of, of accretion. On the other hand, if we compare the amount of energy which is liberated in those events, it's insignificant with the amount of radiation from the sun. So in my lecture, I will concentrate only on those things which are really spectacular from the point of view of the, of the emitting source. So I will ignore those uh, things which were listed above, although they are interesting by themselves. And I will concentrate on, on actually uh, things where this accretion is spectacular, like binary systems, uh, uh, active galaxies, gamma ray bursts also can be uh, treated as, as accreting uh, sources. And then, of course, we now see gravitational waves when we see mergers. This is also a kind of spectacular accretion. And actually, if we, if we invert the, the, the problem and we ask ourselves what are the most uh, bright sources on the sky, most of those are accreting sources. 
And this, this fact, this understanding came actually from the technological process, because this was not the view which we had 100 years ago. So let's talk for a while about the discovery of quasars, which are the most bright, persistent sources. They were discovered uh, as a result, indeed, of technological progress. So after the Second World War, radars were used uh, to do astronomy. So radio sky opened for us for the first time, and several sources were noticed. Uh, Russians were mostly paying attention to uh, active galaxies, uh, to galaxies which are also radio emitters. And they, they, they made people like Szkłowski, Voronco, Velyaminov, uh, they, they made, uh, they tried to describe those, those sources, they paid attention to sources having broad emission lines, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, observational uh, progress was made mostly in, in Cambridge, where the, the instruments were, were developed and catalogues were made. So the uh, first Cambridge catalog had stars in the title, so it did not yet look quite promising for, for, for us. This is the, the picture of the antenna used for uh, one first Cambridge catalog. I got those pictures from Richard uh, Wielewinski. I, know, I don't know the source. I don't know how, how he got it from. It's not possible to find it easily in the internet. I mean, for the first uh, Cambridge uh, catalog. The more attractive was the third uh, Cambridge catalog, which contained a few hundred sources, including 3C273 and 3C48. But 3C48 uh, had a com optical companion, but it didn't look like anything reasonable. It was a point like source, nothing of interest. 3C273 had no optical counterpart. There were many sources with no optical counterpart because the error bars on the position of the source on the sky, radio source on the sky at that time, was very large, so you, you could find hundreds of optical, possible optical counterparts. So the intelligent thing was made by, by Hazard. He used uh, lunar occultation of the, of the source to, to get precise coordinates for 3C273, which really identified the, 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 the optical counterpart. So Oke okay, and uh, Martin Schmidt, uh, they got the optical spectrum. And well, still it was not quite obvious what, what to do with this uh, spectrum, but Martin Schmidt was looking at the spectrum, looking, 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 and then he realized that what he sees are Balmer lines. The quality of this image, unfortunately, is not very good. But it's really impressive that he, he, he understood the situation because this is the, the spectrum of 3C273. There is something like a line here, like a line here, and like a line here. On the other hand, he used the comparison spectrum with really a lot of lines. So it was not obvious which lines to, to, to compare. I don't know whether he had an intuition that first he should look at most abundant element, I mean hydrogen, and then he noticed, because here in this comparison thing, hydrogen lines are not the strongest. So if you have a comparison spectrum like this, it's really misleading. So, but somehow he concentrated on, on hydrogen and then he realized it's just the same thing here and here, but shifted. And then he interpreted this as cosmological uh, redshift. And then from the visual magnitude, pretty large 12.6, he calculated enormous luminosity. And this really was how quasars were 
born. And in addition, the source is somewhat variable in the optical band, which gave the, the, the limits to the, to the size of this, of this thing. So this result was published in 63 and in 64, Zeldovich and Salpeter immediately interpreted this as a creating black hole. Well, precisely the term black hole was not yet used in those papers. That it was born a bit later, I think at the end of, of 60s with quite complicated uh, history. I don't remember it in, 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 in details. Sometimes it's said that it's, it's, it's Wheeler who started to use it, but that's not quite correct, I think. So this is how quasars were born. And then for many, many years, quasars were treated as something which is quite different from those radio galaxies I mentioned before, right? Because then quasars were point-like sources in the optical wavelength, while galaxies were galaxies. So the, some people for many years tried to say that they are close to, 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 to Earth or whatever, or in our uh, Milky Way, but the, the redshift is caused by the velocity. Uh, nowadays, we, we have no doubt that the quasars are just uh, nuclei of, of uh, galaxies. So uh, in the optical band, if you don't do anything, then 3C273 photographed by, by Hubble Space Telescope indeed looks like a point-like source still. But here, this is also the image from HST. And in that case, the, the, the central part was blocked by coronograph. And then you see the galaxy around it. It's not really perfect, but, but you see it. On the other hand, in the case, this was the first image of the relatively distant uh, quasar, uh, a host galaxy of a relatively distant uh, quasar. But in nowadays, uh, studies of the host, uh, a host of, of nearby quasars is, is a kind of a routine task. And in the case of somewhat closer, quasars, you don't need even coronograph. This is just a just the image. It's not quite clear, but you see here spiral arms. And in, in that case, you don't see well the spiral arms, but you still can identify the, the galaxy as a spiral. So now we do not uh, say that quasars are kind of, of different. We, we talk about active galaxies. On the other hand, sometimes we introduce a criteria to, to divide into quasars, brighter and less bright uh, Seifert galaxies. And then the, the definition, which is sometimes used that if you calculate nu and nu, which is the luminosity in the rest frame of the quasar and you multiply it by the frequency, then if the source is brighter, the log is larger than 44.5. This is a quasar. If it is less bright, it's not a quasar. Simple definition as that. And log nu and nu, what, what it is. Maybe you, you know it, but just in case you don't. Uh, we usually plot AGN spectra in two ways, and this depends on, on the aim, what we want to do. So, for example, if we are interested in emission lines, we use usually flux linear scale this is the wavelength. Wavelength is going in this direction. This is flux, also linear scale. And this is the composite spe quasar spectrum, relatively recent from, from Harris, from SBSS both. And you see here very clearly a lot of emission lines. This is on the UV part, so you have magnesium 2 here. Uh, H beta should be 
more, more to the right, but look. So on, on such plot, lines are much better visible. So if you model emission lines, you use this kind of plot. On the other hand, if you want to uh, understand where most of the energy is dissipated in a quasar, you, you build SED and then you, you use the, the, the plot First of all, in the rest frame always. This is sometimes done in the rest frame, sometimes in the uh, observed frame. Well, here you plot the frequency, but log scale. And here you plot log of the flux, but multiplied by the frequency, because this axis is logarithmic. So this multiplication it allows you to see where most of the of the radiation is dissipated because if you look at this peak this is where most of the energy comes from so here is wavelength here wavelength of course goes in the opposite direction so you already see from this plot this is just one example which i i i found any quasar would would do it shows you that this is the main component of, of the quasar. This radiation comes from an accretion disk. We will be talking about it and it peaks in far UV, but if you have higher redshift, then you can see uh, UV part quite uh, conveniently. But even in, in quasars, you can have some contribution from the stars. This is the, the, the uh, blue thing, this is old elliptical uh, galaxy, which is the host galaxy. There is also starburst, which is here plotted. So it kind of modifies this part of the spectrum, even in the case of quasars. So the traditionally we said, oh, quasars are so bright that even in the optical band, the spectrum is just a quasar spectrum. No, there is a starlight there and we have to be quite careful about it. And there is additional dust, which was not here, modeled. So this is why this new L new is quite useful. It shows you where, where the energy peaks. And then in this case, 45 would be somewhere here. So this source is of course a quasar not a seaford galaxy. Now the second leg to this problem is X-rays. That happened a bit uh, later in 1962. I think I did not put this date here. But that was also because of the, of the uh, war technology progress. Rockets were invented, mostly V2 by Germans, and then this technology was transferred to uh, US and, and further developed. And rockets started to be used for, for study of the uh, ionosphere, upper, upper layers of, of the atmosphere. But Ricardo Giacconi, who is here, uh, showed he wanted uh, for the first time to record x-rays using uh, some kind of rockets. Uh, about two were too, too large, so he, he concentrated on aerobie rockets, which were not, not too big. Here you see a human and, uh, and the rocket. And uh, after a couple of, of years of, of fighting with uh, uh, military people to let him have something on, on, on the rocket, he, he succeeded. And this is actually the first uh, uh, observation of the, of the X, uh, uh, solar X-ray source, Scorpio X2. So here it's in a sense, it's time because this rocket was, it was not like, uh, you know, pointing uh, observation. The rocket was there and the sky rotated, I guess. 
So finally, what was displayed was uh, just the whole view around the satellite. So it is displayed as from zero to 360 degrees. And that the lower curve is just background. And the upper curve is the detection of the source. So detection was quite clear. On the other hand, they worried a lot because moon was quite close to the peak of this location. So at the beginning, they worried that maybe this emission comes from the moon. I'm not sure if I can use this laser pointer. Okay, so position of the moon was here. But still the peak was here. So finally they, they got convinced that they, they really see the first source. And why, uh, why the rocket? Of course, that's clear because the atmosphere, fortunately for us people, is not uh, transparent to, to, to X-rays. So our atmosphere is only transparent to uh, optical, very near infrared emission that, that there are some windows, then the radio, of course, yes, but everything like you, far UV, X-rays, uh, that's, that's blocked by the, by the atmosphere. So a lot of results later were achieved from satellites like uh, Chandra, Rossi, Rossi already died, but Chandra and XMM are still active. New Star is uh, also now, it's one of the newer uh, satellites active. And of course, in the future, we expect also spectacular satellites like Athena, Agata Ruzhańska here is involved in, in this satellite. So why, uh, why X-rays were so important and why uh, Scorpio X2 was detected in X-rays and not in the optical band. There are two reasons. Uh, here you see the spectrum, not of, of that one, but of, of Cygnus X1. Here is the energy already in X-rays. So if I talk about KVs, this is X-rays. So you see that it's not quite new if new diagram, but still the peak would be somewhere here. So most of the emission is in X-rays because this is the soft state of this source. By the way, we will talk about states later on. So if you go to the optical band, you wouldn't see much. That's the first, uh, reason. The second reason is that we have a lot of extinction in our galaxy and galactic sources are mostly in the equatorial plane where the extinction is huge. On the other hand, if we talk about uh, quasars, we usually concentrate on objects which are perpendicular to the galactic plane. And because we are, I mean, we solar system quite far from the center, the view perpendicular to the galactic plane is quite uh, clear, relatively uh, clear. So in the case of, of galactic uh, sources, we, we do not know much about the optical part. In addition, sometimes the optical part is dominated by the companion star because the binary system consists of a, a black hole or a neutron star accreting and the companion star can be bright. In this case, uh, the companion star is uh, O9 type uh, bright massive star. So in the optical band, you see just the, the star. Uh, in, the, in the lower mass sources, uh, you can see a bit the companion star. You can see a bit of a creation disk, but not much. It's difficult. It's faint and the obscuration is really dramatic. So the only uh, uh, example where you can see that actually uh, 
galactic sources are very similar to quasars. Is this X-ray nova with this number 1118 plus 480? Because this is a very nearby source. I don't remember the distance, but it's really tiny. So then the extinction towards this source is, is like in, in the case of quasars. It's almost nothing. So in that case, you see this new FU plot, and you see that, well, most of the energy is actually again dissipated in, in, in far UV. But of course, you have additional X-ray emission and similar X-ray emission you will have in quasars as well, but I just didn't show it to you. Otherwise, AGMs are exactly like this. So now some numbers. So if we look at the, at the sky in the optical band uh, using our eyes or, or low uh, small telescope, then we will see mostly stars and stars are not very active and they are not accreting. Those stars which we see in the optical band. So statistically one star per per million is exchanging uh, mass with its companion. So it's significantly accreting. Uh, on the other hand, 50% uh, or so of stars are actually in, 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 in binary systems. Some of them are closed binary systems. The point is that uh, uh, this mass exchange is not always happening. So there are episodes in, in uh, evolution of a binary when this exchange mass happens. This episode can be quite short, but if you, if you check uh, which fraction of binaries ever go through this kind of mass exchange, then it's one in uh, 100. So then it looks like uh, accretion process is important. On the other hand, if you look uh, into the sky in, in X-rays, then the situation is different. So here this plot shows you the X-ray map. This is the ROSAT map. Uh, and this is the optical part of the same uh, part of the sky. So here you see Orion. Those three stars are Orion. So some stars are the same, but here you see many more sources. So statistically, if you take the ROSAT uh, catalog and you just count sources, stars are three to 5%, but what you see is 95% of sources are actually AGM. So your, so your sky is dominated by sources which are dominated by accretion. And statistics also in, in, in galaxies additionally looks much better. It's not one per 100 stars which goes through accretion phase, but it's actually all. And in many cases, we really see the current or the weak activity. So for example, about 30% of nearby uh, galaxies can be classified as, as liners. So they have some, uh, emission lines, although not, not broad, not strong, not spectacular, but something is, is happening. Seaford galaxies, it's a few percent of all galaxies. Of course, very bright Seaford galaxies are rare, like 10 to minus three. Bright radio galaxies, they are even more rare, 10 to minus five, and quasars, let's say 10 to minus six. This is not very accurate statistics because, you know, we don't have uh, really a, a good definition how we are. Uh -oh. There is still some polish here. I'm oh, sorry for that. You know, I gave this lecture some time ago and some parts are new, some parts are translated and apparently, uh, well, something still avoid my, my attention. 
Anyway, we know that all galaxies actually were active at some stage. So this is 100%. But okay, uh, first digression about our galaxy Milky Way. This is no normally classified, of course, as non-active galaxy because there is not much material falling in. On the other hand, if you look closely into the nucleus, then you see that first the, the galaxy mm, contains a black hole mass, that's the relatively current measurement, maybe not, not most current measurement, four million solar masses, black hole. Uh, this is measured at the basis of stars uh, running around the, the nucleus. But uh, also in the uh, in the millimeter or in the infrared or in X-rays, we see a, a regular outburst uh, kind of uh, flickering every few hours, whatever. So something is happening in in Sagittarius A star uh, uh, continuously. Uh, of course, this, this is really very difficult to detect. There is not much energy contained in this kind of flickering. But our, even our galaxy had a better, brighter past. Some few, 400 years ago, it was brighter, although not extreme Seifert galaxy, but something reasonably bright. And we see that as a kind of reflection which is seen now from molecular clouds. Because, you know, if the source here, Sagittarius A star, was at some point bright, it sent the light to those molecular clouds. And then we see normally the, the Sagittarius A star along the direct light, but if you have some kind of deflection, you have also time delay. And if you have several molecular clouds, you can calculate this time delay, and then you can estimate the fast, fast luminosity. So this suggests that some 400 years ago, Sagittarius A star had an episode of, of uh, being much uh, brighter. And then some 10 millions ago, millions of years ago, uh, Sagittarius A star was certainly much, much brighter, like a, like a decent Seifert galaxy. And that is currently seen as Fermi bubbles. So this is a gamma ray sky. This is the galactic plane. And perpendicularly to the galactic plane, you have, you see something like radio lobes, right? This is in, in gamma rays. So this is probably the, this uh, remnant of the past activity. So even in our non-active galaxy, we see uh, obviously the uh, proof that active episodes happens in every, every galaxy. And we know that statistically since more or less the year 1990-98, Statistically, in a sense that somehow the evolution of the, of the galaxy is connected to the uh, activity of the, of the central nucleus. Because we have a very, very tight, but decently tight correlation between the bulge mass of the galaxy and the black hole mass. Of course, black hole mass is something like 0.1% of the bulge mass, so it's tiny. It's not affecting dynamically the bulge, but somehow through this activity, it affects the, the, the growth of the bulge, or the growth of the bulge is affecting the size of the galaxy. This is still under, the, 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 the size of the black hole. This is still under, under discussion how this interaction happens, but the correlation shows that some kind of interaction does happen. Additionally, galaxies evolve statistically too fast if the uh, nuclear activity is not included. So in all uh, uh, computations of, of galaxy evolution, in, in models, you have to include the interaction of uh, uh, 
active nucleus and uh, uh, controlling the starburst rate. And this is also, in a sense, look, uh, seen directly, uh, again, in a statistical way. Here you have a redshift on this axis, and here you have the star formation rate as a function of redshift. So it peaks more or less at the redshift, well, almost two, but more like 1.6, whatever. This is where most of the stars were formed in galaxies. Now you can compare that with another plot with the number of quasars as a function of redshift. And you see that they also peak more or less at the same place. Statistics is not good enough to tell what was first, starburst or quasar. We cannot tell that directly comparing the peaks of those two plots, although this would tell us what is affected what. Starburst affects the, the quasar or the central activity of the, of the black hole or the other way around. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, an obvious argument that in a sense starburst happens first because quasars always have heavy metals. There is nothing like a quasar which has only hydrogen line. Such a quasar was not seen so far and probably will not be. All quasars have a lot of CNO molecules, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So starburst had to happen first. But we cannot tell that directly. This we can only tell from the chemical composition. So now the, the summary, not the whole lecture summary yet, but the summary of, the, of this introduction to introduction. Well, accretion is important because it, without understanding accretion, we cannot describe the formation of the planetary system. I will not talk about it, but keep that in mind. Without accretion, we cannot uh, understand the evolution of closed binaries and we cannot understand evolution of galaxies, as simple as that, so accretion is important. And the, our understanding uh, uh, happened because of the pro technological progress. Radio observations, X-rays, now we will have also gravitational waves. This will help a lot. Also, we have neutrinos, although they are still not very much used, but So I will try to somehow explain to you how we can try to understand all those things, mostly this second part. Oh, although the progress is not as fantastic as you might <laughs> think it is. And then I will talk a, a lot about theory. So it will be a mixture, like going to theory, back to observation, and to theory and to observation. And why I will be doing that? This is a very good example. So if we compare two papers, those are famous papers on, on observations of, of M87. And the first paper, describes that what we see on those images, you probably saw, saw them before, right? It's hot optically thin accretion disk. And this paper explains that what we see is a jet. What is the difference between those two images? Do you see a difference between those two images? No, because this is the same data. <laughs> Just model changed. And model change not actually much. The same model is used in the second paper. People only change the number of non-thermal particles. And that's it. 
So in order to understand what you see, whether you see here an accretion disk like this, or a projection of a jet like this, this is up to the model. So now we will, this will be the second part of the introduction because this is something which will be needed in the rest of the lecture, but it will also show why accretion is so efficient and in which sources the accretion is, is so efficient. So if we have a, a process and any, any source of energy, it's convenient to determine the efficiency of the fuel, right? If you are uh, buying a coal or, or petrol or whatever, then, then you bother with the fuel efficiency. So in general, in all cases, fuel efficiency is, is important, but to have nice units uh, preferentially dimensionless because you know in, in astronomy we have so many units that if we can find something dimensionless that's that's great so to have dimensionless units we use Einstein principle equivalence principle that mass is equal uh, um, energy so the Efficiency is determined as the energy gain divided by the rest mass of the of the fuel used times c square. Very convenient uh, definition. So now, what what kind of uh, chemical process or, or what kind of, of processes we have to to get the energy out? Of course, in everyday life, we basically use uh, chemical uh, processes. For example, the, 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 the heating here is based on, on uh, chemical uh, processes. So uh, the simplest example is burning. Uh, uh, and burning in reality is actually a rapid uh, reaction of uh, with with oxygen and this kind of interaction is physically based on coulomb interaction of electron shells so the, the, the it's difficult to, to 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 calculate theoretically if we have some kind of uh, fuel but we can estimate easily order of magnitude if we assume that we are uh, for example, using hydrogen atom and we can use the binding energy of electron to an atom, to, the, to, 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 to proton. So in that case, well, in principle, we should uh, solve Schrodinger equation and it's quite complicated, but of course, if you can do it, good. I cannot do it, not, uh, at least not, not at this moment. But for, for simple estimate, you can use Bohr model of, of atom. And then you can understand the, the formula, which is for this binding energy. This is for the ground state of electron. So this energy is equal to the electron mass uh, e to the power four and then divided by Planck uh, constant this with dash, whatever. I forgot the, the English name of this Reduced thing. Constant. Reduced? Yes. Uh -huh. Thank okay, you. thank you. So we can, we can uh, derive this equation very easily, a bit cheating, but using the, uh, our knowledge of Keplerian motion. So in the Keplerian motion, the energy on a circular orbit is the potential energy, which is with minus, and this is the Coulomb interaction. Here, I, I, I drop this mu or whatever, which is now present in SE, but in CGS, it was not present, so forget it. And then you, you have the kinetic energy on the uh, orbit. So this is this binding energy we are looking for. Oh. 
Okay. And now we have to take into account that this electron is 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 attracted by by the nucleus. So this is the force. Yeah. I studied that in Polish, and now <laughs> I have problems with <laughs> centrifugal force. Right? This is a centrifugal force. This is attraction force. So you have a balance, and then you you have to cheat. So we have to use quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics tells us that the momentum, angular momentum on the orbit is quantized with n arbitrary, and here is this uh, reduced Planck constant, right? So if we put n equal one, we can combine those two equations. We can put this to the previous equation, and you can derive this one. As simple as that. So, you know, with some kind of cheating, you can determine many formula qualitatively correct. Not quite quantitatively correct, but you know, it's, it's very important in astronomy because we, and particularly in accretion processes, because there are many processes which we don't understand. So first, we have to estimate order of magnitude. Otherwise, we will be doing something very carefully for several weeks, and then we will get the answer, oh, but it's wrong by three orders of magnitude. So in order not to waste the effort, it's always important to start with simple estimates. But of course, if you want to have precise uh, answer, then you have to do it better. So anyway, from this uh, hydrogen atom, we can estimate that the efficiency of a process which can be related to this is something like 10 to minus eight, which is not impressive. So at this moment, uh, you can already say that, well, forget about those processes when you want to explain quasars, right? But for your information, I give the numbers of how it looks like in reality if this efficiency is determined in the laboratory because the simplest estimate, of course, is not viable. Even if you use hydrogen for burning, actual efficiency is 10 to minus 9 not 10 to minus 8. But this order of magnitude, we got it correct. So if you have a car which is using hydrogen, this is the efficiency you can expect. In all other cases, the efficiency is 10 to minus 10, so forget it. Oh, the digression, of course, units. I will mostly use CGS units because I was born in the time when SE did not yet exist. And I think in many papers, traditionally in astronomical papers, CGS is still used. In physical papers, no, they switched. But you know, we still use magnitudes. We still use things which were born uh, uh, thousands of years ago. So astronomy is traditional and we are not going to change. So, you know, you have to, 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 to learn the con many conversions because then if, if there are new windows, then you have additionally new units like KV, maybe whatever, Jansky. At some point, I had a computer program which was recalculating with 64 possibilities, units to units. Uh, in the internet, you can still find uh, useful things uh, in the handbook of astrophysics. Now it's available only after registration. It used to be free in the old time. But anyway, in the internet, you can always convert units to units. So now let's go to nuclear reactions. So in, 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 in the sun and in other uh, main sequence stars, uh, uh, hydrogen is, is burning to form helium. So schematically for hydrogen, uh, four protons are combined together to, to create one helium. 
And this efficiency is much uh, higher. As for order of magnitude, I'm not sure whether this is accident or not, probably not. The efficiency, the gain, energy gain is kind of comparable to the electron rest mass. And electron rest mass, which is something which is worth remembering, is actually 511 electron volts, roughly one MeV in those units. You will notice why it's, it's important when we study, why, why this unit is important when we study Comptonization, for example. Anyway, more precise, if you burn hydrogen to helium, oh, that is missing, you can gain seven MeV per nucleon, and the calculated efficiency is like this, 10 to minus two, more or less. Much, much better, right? That looks sort of promising. But then the remaining part of burning, if you burn helium to iron, it gives you only one MeV per nucleon, much less. So the first stage is very efficient, and this is partially why uh, stars spend more time on, on main sequence, because the fuel is efficient, and the rest is just and that's what remains. So if you burn it to iron, then, then you get only this efficiency, a factor of few lower. And if you look at the binding energy in, in, in the nucleus, per nucleon, then actually burning should start at iron because this is the most stable element. Further burning is not energetically as efficient. So this is why um, iron is so abundant in the universe. On the other hand, in dramatic situation, you can overrate this. So then you can go further in, in, in burning. And I think I will mention that during one of my lectures. So anyway, this efficiency now looks much better. Of course, the, the actual, uh, I should mention that the actual uh, reaction is not as simple as I, I, I wrote in using symbolic uh, uh, thing. So it, the whole reaction of, of hydrogen burning consists of three stages. And the first one is very long. It takes 10 to nine years. So then you create the deuter then creating helium-3 is quite fast, one second, and then two helium-3 atoms or nuclei com are combined into stable helium-4 nuclei that takes 10 to five years. So this is this part which is difficult to pass. This is uh, this PP cycle or proton-proton fusion. This is typical for Sun or other low mass uh, stars. Uh, in the case of massive stars, this reaction is, is kind of too slow and more efficient is uh, so-called CNO cycle where those elements, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen acts as, uh, act, mistake in English, as catalyst. And of course, at the end, the star can also use the remaining helium and burn. We go to gravitational sources of uh, energy. And we use again, is this a problem of this? Echo or not? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So in the case of a uh, infall of a small, let's say, test particle of a mass uh, small m on another body of uh, mass large m and the radius r, well, the, 
potential energy which can be dissipated is given by the product of those two m's and inversely proportional to, to r so we can calculate the efficiency and then the efficiency of course does not depend on this small test mass r it's just this so in order to see immediately for which objects this kind of efficiency is important it's convenient to introduce certain quantity which is named Schwarzschild <coughs> radius and this is its definition and in CGS units it's more or less three times 10 to five times the mass divided by the solar mass. And then the result is in centimeters. And from that, we get the efficiency that it's 0.5 times the ratio of the Schwarzschild radius of the, of the uh, body and divided by the radius. Of course, Schwarzschild radius here is not a pure accident, you heard that Schwarzschild radius represents the horizon of non-rotating black hole. And in the case of sun, the Schwarzschild radius of the sun is equal to three kilometers, as is obvious from this formula. So we can calculate this uh, kind of uh, efficiency for a number of uh, sources in the case of moon the efficiency is 10 to minus 11 not very impressive in the case of earth 10 to minus 10 or actually 11 again nothing spectacular even in the case of sun the sufficiency is 10 to minus uh, 8 i guess six anyway i do not see it well it's small it becomes a bit more interesting if we take the white dwarf Sirius b for example is a kind of, of an, an example of white dwarf so the mass then is of the order of solar mass but the radius is uh, smaller by a factor of 30 and then the efficiency is already comparable to the nuclear efficiency on the other hand if we go to neutron stars Cygnus X, uh, centaurus x1 is a good example then the mass is again the same but the size is of order of 10 kilometers so then this ratio is about three and then efficiency is 10%. 10% of the rest mass you can recover if something falls onto the surface of neutron star and stops there. It's just radial inflow. In the case of black holes, Actually, we shouldn't use the formula before because in that case we have something which has the size of the Schwarzschild radius if it is not rotating. On the other hand, it does not have a surface. If you have an info, then you cannot heat the horizon. You cannot dissipate the energy there. So we will talk about it later in detail. But of course, if you, if you use, uh, without thinking this formula, you would get 0.5, right? And actually, it's not that bad. The usual uh, estimate, which we will discuss in, in great detail later, will cover the, the range from 5% to 40%. So for order of magnitude, it's okay. So, we see immediately that the most efficient accretors are actually neutron stars and black holes. White wars are also kind of important. But there the nuclear burning at the surface is also. Important. I think the white wars played a role historically because they were the first compact object discovered essentially, right? In 
series B was 19th century and uh, the uh, neutron stars and black holes observationally yes. were much later. Yes, that's, so, that, that came later. I think that I think if I remember series B, because when they were comparing it, so that was somehow it led also Chandra Sekhar and others Nas, to to yeah. look into the collapse of of stars. Mm -hmm. so yeah, could, that's true. So historically, they yeah. are important, yes. but we will also talk about uh, eruptions in in wide world dwarf novi are actually the best laboratory for accretion disk because well at least mhd people tell that now that this is the best laboratory it's not quite simple because on the other hand you have the interaction of the disk with the surface of the star but they ignore that and this is why they say it's a simple laboratory it's not quite True. I would think that still black holes are simpler because you don't have the additional problem of the surface of the star. So basically that's all what I wanted to tell you today and next week will be in well, the second lecture. So maybe you, you still have some questions, comments, requests because you, you 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 saw the program so if you if you want me to modify it i'm not sure if i can back yes i can go back to the program oops then i i'm, I'm also open to suggestions because you know that the lecture is not yet prepared so so any questions comments is it too simple, boring? It's not um, too simple. Well, may I it ask will question? Be more. Ah, okay. Question. Yes, ask question. I have few questions at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, one from the beginning, uh, when we speak about uh, accretion, and you show few um, events like uh, Chela Bain's event and so on and shouldn't we think about the creation as some persistent and long-term uh, activity I mean that, yes mm -hmm. that create a lot of amount of energy that it should be persistent or not well uh, in in my lecture we will be talking mostly about persistent sources because in, in the case of quasars this episode of accretion lasts uh, uh, at least millions of years, up to 100 millions of years. So that's pretty persistent, right? Yeah, but when we think about accretion, so we can think about different kind of accretion, like short time or like energetic event that uh, yeah. happened like at the moment. Some, and then... some, some, some events are short, some events are long. Okay. Those are all accretions and even in the case of, of uh, galaxies, some events are unexpectedly short. We now have something like changing look AGN where inactive galaxy all of a sudden became active. But this is even more difficult than studying uh, persistent sources like quasars. So this will be closer to the end and this will be related to the stability of accretion process. But uh, yeah, okay. the nature of this last phenomenon, I, I mean, changing look AGN, this is not yet understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we will talk both about events or persistent things. Mm -hmm. And now when we think about uh, quasars and AGNs, uh, we think that quasars are the only the inner part of AGN of whole of the AGN that have uh, this is show it's the that same. It's, the, it's exactly the same just AGN it's active galactic nucle nucleus right and yeah now Quasar is just the brightest version of active galactic nucleus. Okay, so it's so connected together. We can together divide with... active galactic nucleo, nuclei into brighter versions and less bright versions. Okay. Brighter version 
will be called uh, will be called quasar, and the less bright version will be called uh, Cephered galaxy or or liner or whatever, depending yeah, on classification. What I meant, uh, what what I have in my mind, it was uh, that we call quasar all of the part of the AGN, like the inner part and the host galaxy together. Yes. Uh, host galaxy, no, because yeah, in no, the name okay. of nucleus is nucleus. Right? Okay. okay. So this is the nucleus of the galaxy. We separately mention host of the okay. active nucleus. Right? And but it's always there. Yeah. And then you show the 5% uh, of stars that we can observe in, uh, you, you show, um, I think, the Gaia mission, or I don't remember now. Uh, and then the 95% are uh, AGN. Ah, that, was, that was in Rosat catalog. Yeah, in a Rosat catalog. Rosat is all sky uh, x ray survey, the first all sky x ray survey in soft x rays. And in this 5%, we think about stars and galaxies that are not AGNs? No, no, no. It's just 5% are just stars. Just because, stars. you know, normal non-active galaxies are not seen in Rosa. Okay. So, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I have uh, two questions. One is still is terminological because uh, this quasar, so sometimes in some textbooks they distinguish quasar and QSO, but uh, this is yeah, I, I usually don't do that because now uh, people discuss whether really radio load and radio quiet are separate classes or uh, not quite separate classes. So I will not do this kind of distinction. So for me, quasar is everything, whether it's strong radio source or not radio source, not strong radio source. I will mostly concentrate on not strong jetted uh, quasars when I will talk about quasars, but I will, uh, I will talk a little about jets as well. Then uh, you mentioned at the end in the footnote actually that this uh, optical counterpart of Centaurus X1, they use this term like Kshemiński star and uh, I never heard about it. So if this is some generalized ah. term or is this uh, some no, sort of I, article, I, object only? Or? This is for, for, part, for, for this particular uh, object, and I mentioned that because Wojtek Szemiński used to work in this building for many years. He uh -huh. already died. And it, it, it was quite, quite an effort to, 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 to identify the optical counterpart because as I mentioned be, before, if you have a, a, a source in, in one band and the position there or, of the, or on the position is something like one degree, you can have hundreds of thousands of, of candidate stars and it, it requires some intelligence to, 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 to find the right counterpart. So this was really the optical counterpart of neutron star, not the companion yeah. star. Uh, no, of, <laughs> of well, of, of, of the whole source. Oh, the, okay, so Because the, you see, you, yeah, in X-rays you, you, you see the, the X-ray source, you do not see the companion star. And then you have a position with one degree. And then find which optical counterpart is related. I think he did it at the basis of variability. So this is mainly some massive star, like uh, the companion star, which is the op contributing to optical counterpart. So neutron star is probably negligible in optical bands or... Probably. Or, but still, even uh, the number of, of bright massive stars is large mm -hmm. in the field of view. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, you talk about uh, X-ray observation, but uh, how, what about uh, gamma ray observations? Do we see gamma rays from uh, accreting sources or not? Yeah. So. Yes. Not not from all uh, quasars. Only mm -hmm. those quasars which have uh, jets 
and some C third galaxies. They emit uh, really uh, uh, gamma rays. And this is fortunately possible to measure from, from the Earth, or at least uh, uh, high energy part of gamma rays. And uh, so this can be measured by instruments like HES, for example. Softer gamma rays are still measured from by the satellites at Fermi satellite, for example. But you rather need to jet uh, okay, to go jet as far, yes. yes. So in the time of exchange uh, for uh, Fermi's main sequence starts, uh, but in general, the chance is uh, lower uh, that in the case of uh, white dwarfs or something. But yes. that's that, that yeah, because it's uh, large, so they're bright. Yes. Yeah, but the but the impact of a similar mass on the main sequence stars uh, star does nothing because the efficiency is low. So this is why it's so <coughs> difficult to find those uh, comets falling into into the sun. Right? It's very difficult to, 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 to notice them. It's now a very popular science, uh, citizen science thing. So people look into images from Soho and they ha look really image after image and then they see tiny thing. Oh, yes, it was there. Otherwise, you know, you do not see the flickering of the sun because some comet hit the sun. Nothing happened. So efficiency is per the mass of infalling uh, particle. Right? The same comet, if it falls onto, onto the Earth, it would be quite spectacular for us. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I noticed there was a recently a kind of a controversial paper that this planet nine, which somehow is indirectly implied by uh, this perturbation. That's a black hole or something. That they claim it could be primordial black hole the size of a something like a small ball. Uh, so if, but this this would be probably difficult to, that is when something would be accreting to. To see it, right? Or, or no, or, because you know, in in uh, interstellar or uh, the, the medium, the, the 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 rare medium in in our solar system is is very low density, so no, mm -hmm. that cannot be seen directly. So all those estimates come from the perturbed motion of the of the observed bodies, and that is difficult. So it's really kind of hard mm -hmm. way. More questions, comments? If not, thank you and yeah, see you next week.